is The Chris Abraham Show. This is season five, episode 51 of the Chris Abraham show. I think I called the last episode something like episode 40, but it was actually episode 50. So I'm sticking with it. Nobody took my uh, poll. So it's actually going to go to 100 episodes in season five. We'll see what happens. Maybe 63 episodes since that's my magic number. Anyway, today's episode, going to be a rainy day, uh, is uh, about um, America's current destruction is based on the uh, chemotherapy against American uh, right-wing extremists and extremism, uh, rather than actually from uh, right-wing extremism racism, anti-gay, anti-trans, anti-Asian, anti-black, anti-LGBTQIA+. That the moment that Trump even got close to winning the election, uh, there was a, 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 you know, either an informal or a formalized, by any means necessary, strategy, which was uh, salting the earth. And we have a salted earth. I feel like a lot of doctors these days are saying that um, that uh, there are certain cancers um, that men have, like prostate cancer, that um, generally do not kill the patient. Uh, they are cancerous, but they tend not to, um, what is the term? Um, they tend not to mastic, not masticate. That means to chew. They tend not to, um, infect the rest of the body and kill the patient. And there is a belief that maybe people with prostate cancer do not get extreme treatments such as radiation and chemotherapy and so forth. And that radiation and chemotherapy and so forth is just um, extraneous and uh, uh, is does more to destroy the immuno system than it does uh, with regard. Like this is all changed now that uh, there's much better and targeted anti-prostates uh, tumor systems that are based on. Uh, gene therapy and based on specific DNA based uh, targeting and all that other fun stuff. But let's just, I'm going for an analogy here. I just don't want you to, I just want you to know that I realize that the science has moved on. But um, in many cases, how many people, and I'd love to know the number, how many people succumb to chemotherapy rather than their life if they just suffered with? their cancer in the first place and what about the quality of life what about the willingness to live what about the pursuit of um what about the pursuit of suicide and self uh and you know wanting to end the suffering and the suffering being mostly not from the pain necessarily of the cancer but from the uh lack of will to live from the fatigue and nausea and all the other secondary effects of the cancer treatment. Now, that's always the balance in any, in any uh, environment. But in a, in, a, uh, in a color revolution world, uh, you do the equivalent of, uh, of firebombing uh, Maui in order to lower the cost of living. 
right? You make major cities completely unbearable and disgusting, and all the rich people leave, and quite possibly rents will uh, decrease, or people will just shut shutter their all their buildings until uh, the prices become more favorable. Um, and you know. One might say that uh, in terms of salting the earth, it's become kind of a de rigueur strategy in every environment, right? You have the salty earth strategy in Ukraine right now. Very literally, uh, the east and the west are salting the earth when it comes to the Donbass region. Uh, if you can't, if we can't have it, nobody can. And I feel like in many ways, this is what happened with regards to Trump. I feel like when you go into Trump's actual and legitimately actual plans for his four years, um, now they're completely different. Now he has a goal of vengeance, a goal of vengeance, right? But... uh it's impossible to make this argument because I think that the same people who salted the earth and completely gutted America started a identity politics, uh, cold civil war, uh, have uh, defamed all white Christians as Christo fascists, have um, tried to retype. Um, non-binary and LGBTQIA as being the standard bearer and men and women as being some sort of of uh, of como die, uh, obsolete binary kind of white supremacist patriarchal definition of othering that one uses to say there's a man and there's a woman and never the twain shall meet. So, I mean, I started seeing this um, on the way into Trump. And, I mean, it would be really funny if at some point someone's, uh, whatever, someone's messaging or chat app or whatever were to come out with this sort of shadow government thing. When I worked back in the 2000s, I worked with uh, Ariana Huffington's group, which was this whole shadow convention. And the shadow convention was kind of all about, like, creating a shadow, if you will, government that was contradictory and antithetical to the goals of adventurism and warmongering and conservative politique and uh, Western hegemony and white uh, supremacy as defined by uh, the George W. Bush presidency. Right. Like I could get behind that. I was really anti George Bush and it was exclusively because of his uh, his adventurism, you know, because of Afghanistan, which I also thought was an unjust war. Um, you can't attack a country for the behavior of separatist terrorist cells. Right. Like um, the ISIS and Al Qaeda and Daesh were were not national or country-based organizations, right? Like the people who bombed, sorry, the people who allegedly uh, flew planes into uh, the Pentagon and into the Twin Towers were, you know, not Afghanis. They were not Pakistanis. They were not Iraqis. They were not Iranians, or as everybody says, um, 
Uh, they were, you know, first of all, whatever, like, what was the real narrative of that experience? However, based on the narrative, these were all uh, Saudi. <clears throat> these were all Saudi people. Um, the uh, Bin Laden family is a cosmopolitan, jet set, uh, rich construction development company infrastructure uh just like you know like um like any mogul huh, like trump or whatever like in many ways trump is not the definition what trump does as we see from experience what trump does um the lifer govies as we used to call them the gubbies would have nothing to do with it. People with .gov email addresses would rather would rather Lahaina burn completely down. Would rather the world go to seed than ever let than ever give agency of the office. They even when they said that they when all it was um, like equivalent to when Muslim terrorists uh, give up all of their moral and ethical obligations to Islam, such as they're praying and they're not drinking and they're not sexing and they're being modest and they're following uh, their strictures. When you are amongst the enemy, you need to be able to act in a way that would not draw undue attention to yourself. So even people really close to Trump, it turns out, who were simping after him, who were um, bending the knee, who were kissing his hem, who were saying, um, you know, the king has clothes. Well, when the king had no clothes, right? So, um, you know, Hence, everybody, everybody in the entire universe that could be attributed to either one way or the other, neoliberalism and neoconservatism, this concept of, uh, of, of pro-UN, pro-NATO, pro-adventurism, pro-colonialism, dressed up as an agency... Um, neocolonialism is defined. In fact, there should be a synonym, which is to say neocolonize equals exportation of democracy. Um, cultural hegemony is defined as you need to be free and your freedom needs to be neoliberalism and neoconservatism and you, your democracy needs to be um, a culture of, of atheism, of humanism, and of selective, uh, selective equity and selective egalitarianism. Which is to say, if you're out of line, if you do not, if you do not fit in. If you do not, if you're not willing to comply, um, what you're doing is hateful and dangerous and anti-democratic because democracy is weak and democracy has a glass jaw and democracy is always fragile and we will go to any, we'll preserve democracy at the end of at the end of a, at the end of a gun, the barrel of a gun. So, if it takes totalitarianism and autocracy, if it takes uh, temporary tyranny, so as to uh, be able to like 
radical, radical, radical mastectomies of America, radical mastectomies, anything, cut off everything, cut off the arms, the legs, cut off the breasts, remove the uterus, hysterectomy sitting here, as long as the patient survives in our image, it is all worth it. Quality of life be damned. Uh, yes, you don't have any arms or legs. You don't have the ability to reproduce. You don't have um, any way to suckle child. Um, the definition of a woman is is up in the air. So, let's say all sin, and I'll use a lowercase sin because I'm not talking religion, but everything awful that has happened over the last 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, you know, seven or eight years. Like, let's just say that all those things could have been prevented if people would have followed chain of command. They would have realized that the president has certain abilities to do things, has certain privileges, has certain uh, um, controls, um, is the, if you will, is the, you know, boss of the executive branch. Let's say all those things are true, but if you don't, if you're not willing, if you... So back to by any means necessary. One of the biggest arguments in The Hague when uh, the uh, war crimes tribunal was throwing people in jail and they were going pretty far down the uh, chain of command, uh, the rank and file were saying, I was just following orders, right? So the whole concept of following orders in, in support of diabolical Nazi fascism, second coming, killing all brown and black and Semitic peoples and sending Muslims and Mexicans and Jews and uh, Hindus and, 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 and South Asians and Asians and to a gulag to, to send them asunder and so forth, right? Like that's a moral thing to do, right? A moral thing to do is I refuse to follow your orders because your orders are in support of a Hitler. So no matter how much damage to the economy, to inner cities, to uh, sexual politics and racial politics and gender politics and feminism, no matter how much, no matter how much the right has been actually activated, and no matter how much the populist left have been driven into the arms of the populist right, and no matter how um, incidental, like, I wouldn't say that seeing Jimmy Dore and Russell Brand and Joe Rogan and Tulsi Gabbard uh, and even Tucker Carlson and I mean, he's a right-wing guy, but, like, Jimmy Dore is a populist leftist. Russell Brand is a populist leftist. Honestly, I'll tell you, um, Tulsi Gabbard is definitely a populist leftist. There are, and, you know, there's the horseshoe theory, which is uh, both extremes have more in common with each other than they do with the establishment center. So... What happens when the observant Muslims, the observant Catholics, who 
in no way, like, I just recently spoke to a Muslim friend. I just recently spoke to a Muslim friend, and if he said that his, uh, he told me that if his son is gay or non-binary or trans, he'd kill him. And that in order to prevent that, like, if anything starts happening to that in a real way to his little family, he's going back to Albania. Like, fuck this. Right? So you have, um, you have religious ADOS, American descendants of slavery blacks. You have um, Catholic Central and South Americans. You have immigrant Africans who are uh, either Coptic or Orthodox or Muslim. or, or uh, And then you have Eastern European, uh, uh, Eastern Ukraine Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. You have Greek Orthodox. You have, uh, you have certain, uh, you have people from South Asia who are very traditional in terms of gender and so forth. You have, and you have lots of people who have no concept of, uh, the rule of law who have like their first generation, right? They have no concept of the rule of law. They have a concept of might makes right. They have a concept of, uh, um, you know, if you take it, you keep it. And I'm really afraid of this activation because even though, according to the media, it seems like, you know, if you combine uh, black, brown, and uh, Jewish um, people and add African-American people, and then add LGBTQIA, it feels like it should be 50, 60, or 70% of the population. But if you add all those groups together, it's still, it's barely 20%, right? So there's 80, let's be generous, 70% people who are traditional, who believe in God, who might believe in angels, who believe in Muhammad, peace be upon him, who love Jesus, who love Krishna, or love Vishnu, who... Uh, believe that a family is a mother, father, and children, who believe in an extended family that includes uh, grandparents, great-grandparents, aunties, and uncles. There are traditional values moving here. There are, since there is a great favoritism for people to keep their own culture, maintain their own culture, and support their own language in their family, there's very little incentive for anybody to uh, assimilate into Western liberalism, neoliberalism. Um, um, there's very little chance that uh, short of second or third generation that these children will become humanist or, or, uh, or atheists. And honestly, the only real atheists there are uh, are people in the Academy of Education. The only real uh, atheists and humanists or scientists or people who have a undergrad or actually a graduate in a postdoc in a PhD or an MD or even there are plenty of Jesus loving accountants, plenty of Jesus loving MBA people. There's plenty of Jesus loving, uh, engineers and there's plenty of Jesus loving lawyers. But if you get into the world of uh, first principles and evidence and and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the world of mysticism and the world of magic and the world of uh, of the paranormal and the world of the supernatural and the world of the of the holy uh, go right out the door. But there's so few uh, people who have graduate degrees in America. I mean, compared to the you know, 380 or 350 or 340 million Americans there are. Um, this is going to be a big, it's, um, it's sort of like, if I want to speak your language, it's sort of like carbon, carbon, carbon sequestration. Is that the right word? Sequestering carbon into the ground, right? And if you tear up the ground, then all the carbon gets released in the air. Like that's always the fear um, and probably a little bit to do with the popularity of the phrase, let sleeping giants lay, 
which is to say that they're, they call it the moral majority. They call it the silent majority. These are people who, unless you um, uh, increase the price of, of beer or challenge the right to guns or make gas too expensive, they will not be activated. And to be honest, all three of those things are in the, in the air right now. So it'll be really interesting I just know that whenever I listen to Alex Jones, he's constantly telling his listeners, I was tricked on January 6th. I was tricked on January 6th. It was a complete honeypot, bait and switch. I was tricked. So don't all y'all take up arms against anybody or anything because that's going to be a trick too, like, um, and all that fun stuff. So anyway, I'm just rambling today. It is episode 51. Today's my dad's birthday. I lost him in 1995. He was 58 years old and had a massive coronary. And we died in Fajardo, Puerto Rico. And by saying we died, uh, everybody in my company fell apart. So I had to take care of all of the details. Um, but I lost something that day, man. I never got it back. I, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking to lose a parent. Um, it's even heartbreaking to have lost my mom uh, about 11 years ago. Uh, still heartbroken about that, even though she wasn't necessarily my favorite person, but she was also my favorite person. Does that make any sense? Uh, so happy birthday, Dad. I love you. Uh, August 10th is his birthday. Anyway, talk to you soon. Lots of love. Bye-bye. for listening to the chris abraham show make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes until next time